Yeah, welcome to our meditation together. And today we are turning to stanza 22 in the text, uh, 37 practices. And for me, this is the heart of the text, at least um, in the way Ken McCloyd guides us through the text. So the practice of this text, uh, of this uh, stanza, recognizing awareness itself or mind itself, it is called in the text, mind itself. It's the practice which uh, Ken McCloyd integrated in many of the other verses before, using other topics like working with anger or desire or death or recognizing the precious human life is an opportunity again and again to point us to awareness itself. So this is the first about non-duality. And one could say that what we start to explore in this in this first in this stanza is the heart of the Tibetan tradition. There is a book uh, by a Solinist Dalai Lama, it's called The Heart of Meditation. And the undertitle of that book is The Recognition of Innermost Awareness. And Innermost Awareness is the translation of Jeff, Jeff Hop, Hopkins, Jeffrey Hopkins of the Tibetan term Rigpa innermost awareness. And in this uh, book, His Holiness says in the beginning, in the first chapter, that the recognition of innermost awareness is what the Tibetan tradition rests on. And he describes it as the connecting factor of all Tibetan lineages. And maybe one can go even further, like uh, Lama Yeshe in his book, Introduction to Tantra, who says in the beginning of the book that the recognition of the nature of your mind is the common factor in all mystic traditions and all spiritual traditions. So that could be the case that uh, all spiritual traditions uh, transmit and rest upon recognition of innermost awareness in the mind of their founders and that all philosophy all practices have been developed in the attempt to share that recognition that experience of mind itself and a glimpse and that's the approach of Ken McCloyd on this text, you know, a kind of Mahamudra view on the text. A glimpse of awareness itself, Buddha nature, ultimate bodhicitta, the emptiness of your mind. Ajahn Shah of the Thai forest tradition calls it the one who knows. So it's easy to make bridges to other traditions. So a glimpse of that, uh, some people would call that a first awakening. And then stabilizing that recognition and allowing a shift to happen, a shift of identification, identification from the content to that which is experiencing, stabilization of that would be liberation. And in that stabilization, the Tibetan tradition says the innate capacity of the five wisdoms, the five wisdoms of the Buddha nature start to bloom. And once these innate factors, this five wisdoms comes to its full bloom, full bloom, that would be called enlightenment. Yeah. So we have this a bit of a progression from awakening, a first glimpse to liberation in identification as like inhabiting the place of that which is aware instead of what you're aware of. And then 
enlightenment would be from that liberated state, from that shift of identification, a blooming of the innate capacities of the five wisdom, that would be enlightenment. So the, the practice I would like to share with you today is uh, sometimes it's called in other traditions, not so much in the Tibetan tradition, it's called in self-inquiry. And I just want to say a few words about self-inquiry because uh, we are going to use this method in our meditation. So self-inquiry is usually asking certain kinds of questions. The essence of the self-inquiry questions would be, who is experiencing this? What is experiencing this? But we will explore different options. So what is important to accept or to, re to, to, to know when you use self-inquiry questions that these questions are not meant to bring you into the rational mind. The questions of self-inquiry, they could be also answered in a philosophical or psychological way, but that's not the purpose here. So instead, a self-inquiry question is meant to direct the beam of attention, yeah, so we are all able to direct or influence the beam of attention. That's what you do in meditation. Like I, if, I would, if I would tell you now to bring your attention to your right hand, to the sensation of your right hand, you don't know exactly how how you do it, but you are capable of directing the beam of attention to a certain aspect of your experience. In this case, the sensation in, in your right hand. So in many meditation practices, or in all meditation practice, we work with that capacity. We stabilize it, we get to know it. We, um, we, we start to see that it's not always the most wholesome we pay attention to. Is there something more wholesome in the field of my experience I can pay attention to? And we explore how can we keep the beam of attention directed towards what is important to you instead of our beam of attention as it is often in daily life. It just goes whatever comes and whatever. Yeah? So it, there's no control and no awareness of this capacity. And in meditation, we get to know that capacity. And in many meditation practices on the progressive path, we direct the beam of attention to the content. We do a loving kindness meditation. We, we bring our, the beam of attention to the breath. We, uh, we do an analytical meditation. So we bring the beam of attention on the way, on the way, uh, uh, on, on the, onto the level of our, of our conceptual mind. So we work with the content and we also work with how we pay attention. That's an important part of this, this exploration. Not only what we pay attention to, but how we pay attention. So the self-inquiry questions, they are meant to influence this beam of attention and turn it towards the source of the attention. You could say to the attention itself or to that which pays attention. 
So it's not meant to bring us into some reflections or some, some, some answer. Yeah? So it is a certain way of looking we are invited to. And that's what self-inquiry questions can help us. There's many metaphors, metaphors uh, we have been using, like the clouds and the sky, very common. So in that metaphor, we would say, the self-inquired question is supposed to help us, instead of being hypnotized or entranced with the clouds, to turn the attention to the sky. Or another metaphor I've been using is the, 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 the ocean and the waves. So here, self-inquired question are supposed to bring our curiosity away from the waves and the identification with the waves to water or to the ocean. And today, and, and another uh, metaphor I used is the mirror and the images in the mirror. So, um, a self-inquiry question is supposed to make us curious about the mirror-like capacity, one of the five wisdoms, the mirror-like wisdom. Usually we are interested and our attention goes to the images in the mirror. So now the images in the mirror are a proof that there must be a mirror and we oversee it because we are not interested in it. We don't pay attention to it. It's always there. It's very close, so close that we miss it. And it's His Holiness, one of the words he uses for innermost awareness or mind itself is ordinary mind. It's very ordinary. You could almost say it's boring because nothing is happening there. Another metaphor, and I haven't been using this metaphor so far, it's if you imagine a white white piece of page, uh, a, a white a white piece of paper, and there's a script on it. So the script is the stories of the narrative self, or what we believe to be, or the, or the, or the words and and explanations and judgments and movements of our mind. But there's also the white piece of paper. And in a self-inquiry question, we are invited to become curious and passionate about the white piece of paper. And that's difficult because there's nothing interesting there. It's just a capacity. Yeah. So sometimes, uh, teachers who want to share this experience um, say it's nothing, yeah? it, it's nothing. So we, we are looking for, we, we try to convince ourselves to be interested in nothing. Now, this is a very special nothing. And um, experiencing or recognizing that nothing is the end of seeking is liberation, is, is, is what will quench our thirst. And I'm saying that just as a kind of bit of an advertising, yeah? Because usually we are not interested in it. And maybe we have even an idea that awakening is a kind of extraordinary experience, something special, yeah? Something, something kind of kundalini awakening, one with everything, ecstasy experience. But uh, a kundalini awakening, one with everything, opening your heart experience is exactly that. It is an experience which comes and goes. Now we become, or well, we are supposed to become interested in that which is aware that which is not changing, that which is prior to difficult experience and the most amazing spiritual experiences. There's a common factor there, a common, you could call it presence, mind itself, the ever-present witness, yeah? And then 
at one point letting go of all these words and recognizing or resting, resting as Ken McLeod also uses often, resting, resting right there as that. So some teachers change the language here from becoming aware of aware, uh, becoming aware of awareness or becoming conscious about being conscious to resting as that, inhabiting not the script on the page, but the page, inhabiting not the clouds, but the sky, inhabiting not the waves, but the ocean. All these metaphor fall short. That's the challenge here. So we move into the realm of, uh, we, we need to move into the realm beyond conceptual understanding. In this stanza of 22, something is shared, which is beyond the rational conceptual mind. It's a different kind of recognition, so much so that that kind of knowing is sometimes called not knowing. Yeah? Because when we, were, when we use word like recognizing or experiencing or knowing, that implies that there is someone there knowing something or there's someone there experiencing something. So any kind of word immediately brings us into the dualistic uh, separation, into the dualistic um, distortion of reality. So all, what you could say is uh, this kind of self-inquiry asks us to trust our intuition. Another word, you no, know, if we use words like mind itself or Buddha nature or Rigpa or the ground or pure awareness, uh, that sometimes uh, sounds so dramatic. So one, one other word for, for, for this experience is experiencing you, you, just you. And here, not the you which is identified by something which comes and goes, but the you which is prior to any experience. It's like the mirror is prior to any image arising in the mirror, prior. So it's the you which is always there already. It's, it's the, it's, if I would ask you, how does it feel to be you? No, how does it feel to be you? That would be a self Inquiry question. So, how does it feel to be you? But you you allow that question to really kind of go deeper and deeper. Yeah, so, the you which you would have found if I would have asked you that question ten years ago, the same you, the same you which you are already in, 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 which you already knew when you were a child when you were a child just your presence just consciousness being conscious uh, that you the same you maybe we can write it with a capital letter just to make a difference between the usual confused identification with the content I am this, I am that, I am a woman, I have this problem, I have this, this past, I, I'm, I'm afraid of this future. Um, so that would be the small you and the capital letter you 
would be the common factor that which is present already, that which is already the case. As I said before, the challenge here, as I say in the Dzogchen teaching, is it's too simple, it's too close. We oversee it. It's you, it's just you. It's, it's nothing special. It's not the Dalai Lama you, it's not the Buddha you, it's just you. Yeah. It's ordinary. It's nothing, but, but what a nothing. So maybe that was the meditation. Now I can go to the talk. <laughs> Self-inquiry is short moments repeated again and again. So once you get a kind of a taste of this practice, that's the practice also in daily life. Yeah? Asking a self-inquiry question which works for you. If you're challenged, for example, a difficult emotion arises, what is experiencing this? This makes, of course, only sense if you have familiarized yourself with this unexplainable movement, that unexplainable shift in formal practice or in the transmission of a master. You have recognized, you have familiarized yourself with it. And then that simple question within, in the midst of a challenge can create a shift. So that shift is not necessarily so dramatic that the challenge disappears and the reactivity disappears, but something opens up. It doesn't exclude the relative I, it doesn't exclude the world. Something opens up, something which is bigger than you, you as you know, the brain jelly identified with the body. So something opens up. And you can't explain it. You can't put your finger on it. So we will start in our practice as always. Very important to create a safe space, to create a sacred space, or to recognize that by joining this meeting, we join a sacred space and we join the support of the Sangha. So whatever you know about the six preparation practices, the preliminary practice, and I will bring some of those into, our, into the beginning of our exploration, in, in this context, it, it's meant to create an experience of safety, of groundedness, of a, an experience of being held. This is important, is important in every meditation. This could be actually the main purpose of your practice, to learn to create that sacred space to learn to create a safe space for you. But it's particularly important in any kind of self-inquiry because it's frightening for the narrative self to relax. And if you don't feel safe, the narrative self will resist any kind of deconstruction. So if you are familiar with tantric practice, if you have ever done like a longer tantric sadhana, the first part is just about that. And then you even, you call dharma protectors and you know, and a watch of fence around you and, 
and you call your mentors and you call upon the Sangha and refuge and bodhicitta and all of that calms down our nervous system, calms down our creative, our reactivity, uh, brings us into the body. And then from, a, from, from feeling held and supported, we start to deconstruct. And we can start to deconstruct our sense of identity because we feel safe. So let's take our seat. Yeah? So that's one of the preparation practices, one of the six preliminary practices to take your seat as a son or daughter of the Buddhas. And we take our time to adjust the posture a beautiful myth about that is you know, the, the moment the Buddha took his seed, his vacha seed under the Bodhi tree uh, with, with a pledge, uh, with a promise and to be here, to be with what is, to be with yourself. And here yourself meaning the relative, the content of your experience. So adjusting the posture and appreciating that we're doing this together. By assuming this posture, we connect with the others. We're doing the same. We're not alone. And we can broaden that, that field by connecting with all others who right now in this moment, taking their seat as a practitioner not only in the Buddhist tradition. The, the posture of the warrior, the spiritual warrior. And if you like, you can close your eyes. If you keep your eyes open, they, your gaze is relaxed. Noticing, noticing how you sit. Maybe there's still some adjustments happening in, in your hips, in your spine, in the position of your head. There's a balance or an alignment with gravity in the posture. But there's also gentleness, tenderness. It's alive, the posture is alive, it's flexible. And you notice how the earth carries you. And you feel the safety of the earth, the chair or the floors which is carrying you. And you allow a shift hap to happen from the head into the body, from the doing to the being. So you gravitate towards present moment awareness. Our senses are open. And the natural flow of the in and out breath can be a, an ally in this process. The in breath sliding into the trunk of your body and experiencing that as an embrace, breath and awareness, embracing, letting be, allowing, and you welcome the guests, the guest house of the body. And we're doing this together.
And then with the out breath, maybe you can deepen your breath for a few moments. With the out breath, there's possibility of some release in your belly, in your shoulders. You're putting down the burden of controlling, of fixing, of trying to get somewhere. Relaxing the grasping. You unhook from the stream of thinking. Just a less emphasis on the mental images and the inner dialogue. More emphasis on the felt sense of your body, of the breath. And if there's something, some discomfort, a tiredness, restlessness, something that you bring with you into this moment, we allow, we allow that to be holding it softly, touching it gently. Being aware that you share that tenderness with the group. We are holding softly, touching gently the human experience together. The human experience is difficult for all of us. But we're paying tenderly attention to that. Also as a gift for others. And then returning and resting. Entering even more the sacred space of our temple, of our online temple. And into that space, we invite the presence of the Buddha, the Dalai Lama, Lama Supa Rinpoche, other mentors, the blessings of the lineage, Tonga Sangpo, the text, And you experience how you're surrounded by these resources. The loving gaze of the Dalai Lama, the loving attention of Tara. And you allow yourself to bathe in that loving gaze of Avalokiteshvara, of Shenrezik. Or maybe non-symbolic, just a sense of being seen and held and loved, like bathing in the morning sun after a cold night. And whatever arises, sensations, sounds, the breath, feelings, thoughts, they arise and disappear again within that space. And allow yourself to let go because you are safe. There's nothing Nothing here which is threatening you. There's nothing you need to prove, nothing you need to do. 
Nothing is being asked of you. You can be just yourself as you are. And nothing is excluded. Nothing is too much. There's, so, there's enough space for any process, for any experience. Softening and opening. Like a little girl feeling safe in the lap of the good mother. Breathing, the whole body is breathing. What also connects us in our togetherness and our weeness is our intention to grow up, to wake up, to heal for the benefit of all. So beautiful to be part in this moment. to participate, to connect with the Bodhisattva lineage. So now from the preparation practices, we move into self-inquiry. And the first invitation here is to direct that beam of attention to sounds. So I invite you to shift into the area between your ears, into listening. That doesn't mean that other the other things disappear, but they go a bit more into the background and you bring listening to the foreground. Listening to my voice, listening to the sounds around you, maybe also beyond the room, maybe there's some, no, some, some sound coming into your room from outside, and just opening to the soundscape. And that soundscape also includes the silence. So if there's not no particular sounds happening for a while, you stay with the capacity of listening. And returning to that, if you get hooked by something else. And now, in that capacity, broaden that into your whole body. Listening with your whole body, with your whole being. Now letting go of the mental image of your ears and your head. Just listening.
And the self-acquired question here is, where are the sounds? And you listen, where are the sounds? Inside, outside. So when you follow that question, you might come to a place where you can't say, you can't say where are the sounds. You might say they are in my mind, but where is that? So you become aware of a sound of this voice, of something around you. And the self inquiry question is, where is this sound? And then you rest in the listening. not knowing where the sound is. The sound exists, so it must be somewhere, but we can't say where it is. Except we go into our rational mind and tell us a story about brain and ear and what sound is and so on. But here we are looking into our direct experience. Where is the sound? You can't say. So don't say anything. Just listen. You can't describe where the sound is, but you can listen to it. It is somewhere and you don't know where. Where's the sound? Inside? Outside? And then you rest. Most people at this point, they are able to pay attention only for a few moments and then your attention crumbles and you get into something else. And then you do this again, stabilizing with the breath, with the body. And then sound. And then the question, where is the sound? And then you rest, maybe just for a split of a second. This is a glimpse practice. So now we, we shift to another channel that is what is called mental consciousness. So I invite you to evoke or to invite an image of the Buddha or the Dalai Lama. And and just take whatever arises. So the, this is not a concentration practice here. So whatever mental image arises when I say the words Buddha or the Dalai Lama. 
maybe you are not so visual oriented, maybe you hear the voice or you get a sense. But if there's a mental image of a smile, of the eyes, of the shape of the body, just allow that to arise. And staying connected with the body. Bringing a mental image to the foreground. Possible connected with some sensations in your body. So, and then again, self inquiry where is that image? You might say, hey, it's in my mind, it's in my consciousness, but where is that? You can't say. Is it inside, outside? Where can you localize it? You can't. So you rest. You keep your attention, the beam of attention, directed to the mental image. Then you ask the self-inquiry question, where is that image? And you rest in the looking. looking with your whole body. If uh, this question creates confusion or boredom or some resistance, where's the resistance? Where's that boredom? Where's that confusion? If it creates a mental dialogue inside of you, where is that mental dialogue? And you look. And don't worry, for most people, this is a very short moment. Something opens up. You trust your intuition. And then it crumbles again. So you start from the beginning. The body, the breath, mental image. Where's that mental image? You can't say, so don't say anything. Just look and rest. Where's the experience? So, and then again, we change the channel and um, into sensations. And since I mentioned that in the beginning, I invite you to bring your, the beam of attention to the sensations in your right hand. It's a, a subtle object. 
will take a bit of time. So in this exploration, the object is not the mental image of the hand, but the, the energy, the chi, the prana, the sensations in your hand, the felt sense of your hand. not the mental image. And we'll go towards that area which has most intensity. It's, it will be still subtle. You might even not feel anything, but then you look into that, you stay with that. and try to go uh, beneath the mental image into the pure sensation, the chi, the prana, the energy. And breathing or looking with your whole being. So where is that experience? And then you look, or you, you feel, so you look with your whole being, where is it? And then you rest. You rest in not knowing where the experience is. There is an experience, but you can't say, and then you rest. And you return to that resting. So now in our self-inquiry, we move into a slightly different direction. So you stay again and again, you return to the sensation in your hands in, or in your right hand. And there's the sensations, a tingling or sense of aliveness. And the self inquiry question is, what is aware? What is experiencing this? And again, you don't go into philosophy, philosophy or psychology. You look directly. What is experiencing this? You can't say, so don't say anything, just look. So isn't there also a presence? Some people experience that as a kind of spaciousness or boundarylessness. But you can't say, these are just words. What is experiencing the aliveness in your hands? Where is it happening, the experience? It could be a bit of a sense that, that there's something beyond beneath 
bigger than the experience. But the experience is also not separate from that which it's experiencing. So it's also pervading the experience. There's something more there, right? Than the sensations. What is that? Something which is bigger. And in the same time, not separate. And you look, you rest. You rest as that. And again, your attention will crumble because we are, have not trained stability of attention sufficient. So we need to start again. Body, breath, sensation in your hands, beam of attention to the sensation of your hands. And then what is aware? of this, you can't say, so you rest in the non-finding of what is aware, but nevertheless it is there. The piece of paper, the sky, the ocean. Initially, it makes sense to point to something which is bigger or which is beneath or beyond as something bigger there, presence. You are there, you who is always already there. The capacity of mirroring consciousness itself. But then if you look closer, you start to experience how the movement is not separate from consciousness itself. It's pervading. The experience of the sensation in your hand is an experience in mind. And that's how this Stanza 22 starts. Whatever you experience is an experience within mind, within consciousness, within awareness. How could it be something else? Whatever you experience is an experience within awareness, within consciousness. But what is that awareness, that consciousness? You can't say. You rest in the not knowing. And there might be a shift. Trust your intuition. And we are not looking for something special, but we're looking for you. The mirror-like capacity. You can't see the mirror-like capacity directly because it is that which is looking. You can only be it. It's where your looking comes from. And you rest as that. 
rest as witnessing. Short moments, glimpses, split off a second, thought-free knowingness. There's nobody there, just knowingness. Yeah, and then take our time to slide out. I'll bring your awareness to the whole body again. The breath open again to the to your surroundings, to the sounds and to the meeting. And then you take your time to open your eyes. And the visual, so what you see, is exactly as the experience of sound and sensations and mental images, an experience within consciousness, within mind. And this is for us the most challenging sense because with opening our eyes it's very easy to collapse back again into the dualistic split into the illusion of separation and it's very easy again to collapse into identification with the body or with the owner of the body Maybe the eye which is sitting behind your eyes and is looking through your eyes. So, but you would continue this exploration, the self inquiry, which I introduced you to, then also including the visual, which is challenging. So it might be better first to start with sound and then move to the sensations and then move to thoughts. And then you open your eyes and you bring that glimpse of recognition also into the visual field. And most of the time in that moment, all we can observe is that collapse into the dualistic split. And we just recognize that. Yeah, I open my eyes and boom, I'm my body and I'm looking at a world which is separate from myself. It has nothing to do with me. I'm looking at an objective, separate world. But the experience, yeah, where is that? You can't say. Also that what you see, is an experience, is an appearance within awareness, within consciousness. You can't, with sound, it's quite easy to come to that. Is it inside, is it outside? Kind of you, you deconstruct the inside and outside because you can't find the boundary between inside and outside. So the same, it's possible with the visual also, but it takes a bit more experimentation as with the sound. So if you have a question, you can write in the chat, but um, I will also give some space. I just want to had some space for feedback or a question. I just want to read the, the stanza. So 
So whatever arises in experience is your own mind. Yeah? So that's how Tongme Sanpo starts. And that's what this exploration now we did was about. And it's, it, it's, it's quite powerful to, to return to this, to this line, yeah? Whatever I, I experience, and, and we don't need to go into any philosophical discussion. Is there a world outside there? Is there something there? Uh, and if you study the different philosophical schools within Buddhism, you start to realize that they have different answers to this question. Uh, is there something out there? For sure, we can never check because the only thing we can check we do with our mind, with our consciousness. So we, we can never go beyond that. Yeah? But there's different philosophical answer to this riddle. Yeah? Is there something out there? Is there something real objective out there which can, can be found? Uh, but here in this exploration, we don't need to go there because we are talking about experience. We are not, we are not asking the question, okay, is there something there? But there's no, they, they, it's obvious that the experience is an experience within consciousness, within mind. So and then mind itself in the second line. So mind itself, that's the code word of uh, Tongme Sangpo for Rikpa, for the nature of mind, for for non-dual awareness, for pure awareness, unconditioned awareness. So he calls it mind itself, consciousness itself, pure consciousness. Becoming conscious about being conscious. It's also called awareness of awareness. So now when we say awareness of awareness, it's a bit tricky because awareness can never be an object. Consciousness is not an object because Awareness or consciousness is that which is looking. We, we, we can't find consciousness. No. Franciscus of Assisi says, what you're looking for is what is looking. So, of course, he was talking about God, yeah? Uh, so, but, and we are not talking about God here. So we talking about Buddha nature, we talking about Rigpa. So if you want to meditate on the nature of mind, then you don't meditate on an object because the nature of mind is that which is looking. That's why we don't find it. And we are already that. We just, we are already that, but we miss it because when we feel I am, it lands in the mirror images, in the images, it lands in the script. It doesn't, it doesn't land in the paper, in the ocean, in the sky, in the witnessing. So what you're looking for is what is looking. Such a beautiful koan. Yeah, unsolvable. But when we ask this question, the self-inquiry question sincerely, we might experience a shift. And I'm not talking about something dramatic. Awakening is not dramatic. The sometimes a glimpse like that can trigger dramatic experiences like opening of your heart and a sense of boundarylessness or even something scary, yeah? so kind of groundlessness as Pirma Shetran calls it. But these are experiences and they come and go. So whatever we experience in the self-inquiry, be it something amazing or be it something scary, both are possible. There might be a relief, uh, kind of a letting go and opening up, uh, feeling connectedness. Yeah, all of that 
are kind of symptoms and we can see them as signs. Wow, I'm, I'm, I'm on the right track. But then we again have to make the backward step. What is the way of this? So whatever you can describe, whatever you can remember, like, yeah, I felt more peaceful, I felt more connected. That's not mind itself. You make a backward step again. Okay, what is aware? And that which is aware, there's nobody there. So we need to go beyond the idea of the ever-present witness or, so that, that's a prov provisional step, yeah? Like in mindfulness practice, I'm not my feeling, I'm not the sensations, I'm not what I see. I'm that what is aware, like the observer eye, it's it's a healthy, it's a good step. Yeah, it's very liberating. But we need to go beyond that. So we what is aware of the observer of the consciousness, of the witness consciousness? So we go backwards until there is nothing and nobody any there's nothing anymore to step back into, and there's nobody there anymore anymore who steps who steps back initially kind of also Tara Brach in her in her book uh, to refuge she talks about the foreground and the background yeah so the foreground and the background usually we are identified in the foreground and now we're shifting into the background but we need to even go beyond that the concept of back background and foreground. That sometimes can also create this confusion that we are looking something which is transcending the content of our experience, something which is beyond what we're experiencing, like a space. We need to dive through our experience and then we see the light. Yeah? The, this is the provisional helpful uh, direction, but mind itself is your experience. The transcendent is in the imminent. The transcendent is in the experience itself. It's not beyond or beneath or it's, it's even when I say like it's bigger than or uh, it's, it's, it's right there. The ocean is in the waves. You don't need to get rid of the waves to see the ocean. You see the ocean through the waves. All of all of, all of what I'm saying right now is uh, is is meaningless. <laughs> it's it's more like uh, listening to a to a poem or listening to a piece of music. And trusting your intuition, trusting your heart, which already knows, uh, which already knows. We, we, we are not talking about a new knowledge. We are pointing to something which already knows itself. You, you already know, know yourself. Your heart already knows itself. You're just missing it. Because it's, boring, <laughs> ordinary, simple, too close. Yeah, and we can observe our mind saying, yeah, but it, but it can't be like, it's, it, it can't be just me. You know, it needs to be, it needs to be more than that. It, 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 it can't be that simple. I haven't done the work. I haven't done enough study. I haven't done enough preliminaries. It, it, it's, it can't be just me. Baby, it's you. It's just you. Plain old you. And, and I'm not, again, of course, when I say you, I'm not talking about, yeah, I am, I have these problems and I have a car. And so that's the script. 
I'm talking about the, the you which is already always here. The mirror. So then he, so mind itself is free of any conceptual limitation. Yeah? So in other words, uh, and that's one of the challenges on the on this pointing out on the direct path is uh, it's beyond concepts. It's undescribable, ungraspable. And of course we have heard this ungraspable, undescribable, we heard that before, and uh, we can read it and then kind of repeat it. Yeah, I, I, it's, it's not an object of knowledge, it's ungraspable, undescribable. Uh, but to kind of swallow that, it, that's, that's another thing. To, to, to get a, with your intuition, to get a sense that there is a different kind of knowingness. So much different than it's sometimes called not knowing in the Zen tradition, not knowing. But, but it, is, it, is, it, is, it is already the case. Rigpa already knows itself. And it's the only thing which knows anything. It's that which looks through your eyes right now. But it can't be described. So it is already the case, but there is a there's a kind of difference of recognizing that or trusting that or rather than uh, just being in trance with a script. So if someone who is confused and someone who is enlightened, in that, in, in that regard, they are the same. They are the same. And both Rigpa already knows itself. They are already themselves. They are already home. But the one who seems to be confused is still seeking, is still seeking home, is still trying to get somewhere. So, and then he continues and says, know that. So this know that difficult. Yeah? So there's nothing to know. You, you don't know this. You already don't know this. So the, the work is done. Yes? There's nothing to know. But it makes also sense to say, to make a differentiation between someone you, on a, on a relative level, you could say, this person is lost. And this person is not a seeker anymore. The other person is, is not seeking any. So there's a difference. So know that. Yeah. I swear, this is, know that, that's it. Th th that's what the Tibetan tradition is about. And everything else, as Chantideva says in the Bodhisattva in the wisdom chapter, you know, first one in the wisdom chapter, he says, all the other te teachings are being given for the sake of wisdom. And wisdom here is exactly that, know that, that's wisdom. So all the other practices we do, merit, purification, preliminary practice, also, important here, stabilizing your attention, getting to know the intention, all of that is there out of compassion to make it more probable, to increase the probability that that moment of grace happens for us. 
guru devotion here very important also no as an invitation to to surrender yeah? to, to 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 let go of trying to figure it out to let go the the slavery we live under of the narrative self to let go of that yeah? to 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 slip yeah to slip into into this So know that and don't entertain subject object fixations. Uh, to, so that's describing this relaxation of the of the grasping, the, the relaxation of this fixation, fi the relaxation of all the fixations, the fixation with objects but also the fixation with the sense of the I. So to relax that, and, and we start, we can relax that when, when we start to notice this process. This is the practice of a bodhisattva. So, yeah. Centerlessness, yeah. Uh, okay, there's some question. I just. Um... Yeah. So, Teresa, she describes uh, it is challenging. Yeah, welcome to the. <laughs> and most of the time, is it is uncomfortable, and my mind feels like it's shaking, looking for something to grasp. Yeah, so that's. Uh, that's a good description of uh, how this process is experienced. And uh, in this kind of experience, my, my mind feels like shaking. You notice that you know, the narrative self tries to grasp something, um, this kind of contraction. Um, you know, it's like, if something, if something shrinks in us, yeah, if something shrinks in us, that is a good sign. It's it's not like, oh, I'm doing something wrong, or now I should stop this meditation. Actually, this 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 kind of angst can can arise. Um, that is a good sign. It's, it, so part of working with this methods of self-inquiry is to increase our tolerance to swim in that and not to retract from the practice, but to, and to make this uh, wanting to grasp the challenge is uncomfortable. There's some fear, there's resistance, there's boredom. To recognize all of that as a sign that you're looking, that you're going into the right direction and that the narrative self tries to resist and tries to, tries to hold things together. Yeah, because so, so far, many of us think that from the point of the narrative self, that we really enjoy this path of liberation, but we don't. Actually, the, the narrative self, that what, what brought you into the practice, doesn't want to, doesn't, that it's, it's a, it, because it's its end. <laughs> yeah. and, and it tries to, it, it tries to keep itself together. And these are symptoms 
showing that. So, and it's it's healthy if you do this practice alone, not to push too much because it can be destabilizing. So that's why it's if you want to go deeper in this practice, it's very good to have a connection with a teacher or being in a retreat uh, where there is some space for that destabilization, which is it's not a lasting thing, that destabilization, uh, but it can be unpleasant yeah, and can come with fear. So, so, it, so we, we stay in this, we swim in this, in this and we return to that, but we, we do that gently, yeah, not pushing. Uh, and then the experience of that shaking, or it can be even more dramatic than shaking, it can be a, a kind of fear of death. It doesn't happen, but I have, I've experienced it a few times in guiding this meditation in, um, in retreat. I, I had that two times that it triggered panic attacks in people. I mean, full, full blown panic attack. They were sitting there in meditation in a safe place. And I was guiding the meditation. And, and so I could talk about that a long time. Yeah, But it is not like I don't want to scare you. It's, it's usually, I mean, it's, it's rare. It's very rare. But, but you also, that's why it's so important to emphasize the preparation practices. Refuge, bodhicitta, offering. Uh, confession and, and all these practices yeah? so that you feel safe and that you have something to turn to that you don't that you're not alone and if that kind of experience um, are very powerful and recurring that could be an indication for for a trauma so then something uh, what that, that could be an indication that the traditional preparation practices are not enough for you. That you not that you need to look into your attachment styles, in, and, and do some some psycho, psychological work. Yeah, for for like kind of for most of us, we can we can work with this um, with traditional practices, but but. Sometimes it's it's necessary to uh, to look at the, the the root cause of that feeling of insecurity, of that not being safe, of not being held you know, with in your psychological history, because otherwise the protective patterns in you will always prevent you to go beyond. Now there is, it's not, it's debatable, but there's a saying, you know, before you can deconstruct a self, you need to have a self. Yeah? And, and there's some truth in that. Yeah? So that's the idea of centerless. I, I meant centerlessness, yeah? centerlessness. Yeah, so this is one of the um, words which, you know, for some people, something is transmitted with that word. Centerlessness, boundarylessness, boundless. Yeah, so these are words we you don't need to think about it a lot yeah so what what does it mean it's, it's just again it's like listening to a poem to the music centerlessness yeah. centerlessness is the experience that there's no core that there's no yeah or it's the recognition that that experience of a core is uh, is conceptual it's made up there's nothing there. So here also we can see the connection to the 
analytical meditation on emptiness and the experience of no self. So, um, uh, but in the direct path in the Mahamudra approach, we don't approach this exploration from a conceptual, from a philosophical point of view, but, but direct. But it is, it is helpful to combine both an understanding of the teachings on, on, on no self, emptiness of self, selflessness, and, and the, and the dry, direct pointing out. Both approaches guide us into the same kind of experience through, through, through two different approaches. In the first approach, you, you, uh, you start to see what you are not. You exclude what you are not. So you are not that illusion of a solid separate self. And in this self-inquiry approach, in the Mahmudra approach, we come from, uh, from pointing out what you are. So in the Christian mystic, this is called the via negativa and the via positiva. Excluding what you're not, which is in one way a bit easier because it can be described. You, you can point to what you're not, you can describe it. And in the Mahmudra approach, a direct pointing to what you are, which is, which is maybe for more intuitive people a bit easier. Okay. So you're welcome. We uh, share and I, I want to just bring our heart to the war in the Ukraine even from over there, it's far away from your point of view. <laughs> yeah, it feels more that uh, it's just in the neighborhood. Yeah. And um, so one of the really uh, precious contribution to war, the inner war and outer war, uh, which we can uh, which we can contribute to is in our own practice to connect with who we really are because not knowing what we are that's the cause for war in and out of war and, then, and using making that a priority in our life and then starting to show up in our life, not from the narrative self's perspective, but from you, from you as unconditional love, from you as goddess, as Tara, from you as the Buddha within, the guru within, And from that you, you already know what you can do. And you, you would never feel, oh, I don't do enough and I should do more, what can I do? Yeah, so that you already knows that what you're doing, what you can do on the relative level. So may, may all powerful people awaken to their true nature particular Putin and the others. I mean, that's all what is needed. You know? Because in that regard, they are not different from us. May all powerful people, I mean, everyone, of course, you know, also the people who don't have power, but, but a particular dedication for the people and power and may they awaken to the true nature, to mind itself. How can we help them? 
We need to awaken ourselves. That's the only way. That's our contribution. So thank you very much. It's a pleasure for me to talk about that which I can't talk about. <laughs> Somehow it's very exciting for me. Because <laughs> this is it. And uh, just mentioning the names is so precious and coming together in this spirit. And I think tomorrow, I'm not sure, but I think probably something more uh, about this uh, stanza will come up and maybe you can bring some, some questions around uh, this. So I think we will, uh, if for tomorrow, also stick here, I guess so. Yes, have a nice day. Thank you. Thank you so Bye. much. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Good night, Stefan. Thank you. Okay.